You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 130. Today, we're talking about how to talk so little kids will listen with Joanna Faber and Julie King. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. In Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clarkfield's Mindful Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate calm in their daily lives to create more peace and cooperation in their families. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I'm the mom of two girls who challenge me every day to hone my craft. It gave me a little bit more of a sense that I was okay, whoever I was, and that I didn't need to change who I was so that I would be fit in with the cool kids or with the in crowd. And I think that was part of my mom's gift to me. I'm so glad you're here, my friend. Challenge me every day is so true because they went to their first day of school today and yesterday, as you can imagine, was a little challenging. I think that's a story for another day, though, because in just a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Joanna Farber and Julie King, the authors of How to Talk So Little Kids Will Listen. Ah, it's so exciting. I'm so excited to talk to them. They are the authors of this book, and you may recognize their names because they are the second generation from How to Talk So Kids Will Listen. They also have authored the app, The Parenting Hero, and the soon-to-be-released app, The Pocket Parent. And Joanna and Julie lead workshops, consult with parents, and give lectures on parent education presentations across the United States and internationally. And when you come with me, my dear listener, and we sit down and talk to them, it's a great conversation. They talk about practicing mindful parenting with the little kids and how these communication lessons that that can really completely transform your relationship with your toddler and and you'll and I can attest to this so we're going you're going to hear about how threatening is less effective and the power of accepting our kids negative feelings and you know they can relate how it's really not easy to change your language so we're going to talk all about that. I can't wait for you to join me at the table with this conversation with Julie and Joanna. And first, I just want to invite you really quickly to join me in the Mindful Parenting free training that is going to be starting on September 17th. You can join at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. Or if you just go to mindfulparentingcourse.com, it should there should be a redirect there to go there. But in this free training and in this time, I'll be connecting with you live, doing live coaching. There's lessons and webinars. You're going to learn a whole bunch of stuff, connect with a whole bunch of other mindful mamas. And if you can't make it live, we'll record it for you too. So this is an exciting moment that only happens a couple times a year. So I hope you'll join me and we can connect in person for that. Now, on to this episode. Julie, Joanna, I'm so glad you could come on the Mindful Mama podcast. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you're here. So this is this is going to be experiment because it's my first time talking to two people at once that we are in different places, but I think we're going to make it work. You guys seem to have a good vibe about you. <laughs> so you grew up like a block away from each other and you were raised, wait, now I think it was Joanna, you were raised by like the parenting guru of the time, yes. right? Right? <laughs> I you didn't had, like, know it at the time. <laughs> I you, thought it was a normal childhood. <laughs> you had the optimal childhood, but you didn't know it. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to grow up the child of the author of How to Talk So Kids Will Listen? Well, <laughs> at the time it seemed regular, but... I guess I could say, I feel like in looking back, having my mom for a mother, it didn't, you know, protect me from the the harshness of the world, but it made me stronger to face the harshness of the world. And 
I thought of this one memory I have to share with you of when I was in first grade and our teacher, Mrs. Gunderson, required us, same teacher as Julie had, (laughs) required us to color in the margin of our writing exercises so that it would be beautiful. That was a requirement, that the margin be beautiful. Now, the margin was very skinny and we had fat crayons. So, you know, I went through my repertoire. I made stripes, horizontal. I made vertical stripes. I made zigzags. I made polka dots. (laughs) I ran out of ideas for what you could do in in a margin. And, you know, little kids take these things very seriously. Like there was a requirement that it be beautiful. And I remember being very stressed out and worried about this as a kid. And... And I told my mother, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what she wants us to do in the margin. And my mom looked thoughtful. She's a very thoughtful person. And she said, hmm. She said, you know, there are some artists who really like working in tiny little spaces. And other artists like working in big spaces. There's this one artist. His name is Jackson Pollock. He puts canvases he covers the entire floor with a canvas and throws buckets of paint on it and she said to me you know maybe you're the kind of artist who likes to work in big spaces and i felt better and i said to myself yes that's the kind of artist i am so i went back to school and the next day the teacher called me up for my writing assignment to be checked and she said what is this? You didn't fill in the margin. You didn't make it beautiful. And I said, Mrs. Gunderson, I'm the kind of artist who likes to work in big spaces. And Mrs. Gunderson said, get back to your seat and color in that margin. (laughs) So I resentfully trudged back to my seat and colored in the margin. I think I colored it in black. But, you know, I, I just remember that. I remember thinking, oh, well, I have to do this. But I I was no longer worried about it. (laughs) Like, I had a mom who understood me and understood the kind of artist I was. And that was enough for me. So that's that's a great gift to go through a childhood with with a parent who understands who you are and and accepts who you are. Because kids... Kids stress out about every little thing. Kids take things very seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. That you know, you're saying have a parent who understands and accepts who you are, and I think that's. That, I love your story. <laughs> that's such. That's it. Is like that. Your mom saw you in your kidness, and she respected you for who you are, and you really felt that. That sounds like that. Really, you felt that kind of coming through in your whole childhood. I imagine there wasn't like a lot of yelling. She's not a real yelly person. I remember her getting angry. I think my two brothers and I drove her crazy sometimes, as young kids will. But for the most part, my mom is was pretty laid back, yeah, pretty accepting person. Mm, mm, that's cool. So, so how about you, Julie? What was it? What was it like? You know, you wrote this book about how to talk, so little kids will listen, and we're gonna. I can't wait to talk about some of the ways we're gonna. You know, you can help parents of little kids talk to them and communicate better, but, but you also grew up in, what was it like growing up? What was your parenting, you know, what were your parents like and, and your experience like growing up as a kid? Well, my mother and Joanna's mother were very good friends. They met when we were babies. And when we were, Joanna and I went to nursery school together. And when we were in nursery school, her mother took a parenting group with Haim Gannat. And then she would talk to my mother. According to my mother, they talked daily on the phone in the morning about what was going on, what they were going to try. So, I, of course, I was not aware of this when I was in nursery school, but I was a guinea pig for this approach as well. <laughs> and I knew that they were very good friends. And as we were growing up, I remember going to Joanna's house and her mother and the mother of another kid who went to nursery school with us, they would be writing on big yellow legal pads is what I remember on the kitchen table. And I later found out that they were writing this book. And eventually I actually got to read the book, which I thought was pretty cool. But I think that when I was little, I wasn't aware of all this, but I did have a mother who was also very accepting. And I think that gave me sort of a a sense of myself that 
you know, when I think back to maybe it was middle school or high school and kids were, there were kinds of social dynamics where people were being excluded or judged or, you know, there's a lot of judgment about what you were wearing or who you were hanging out with. And I think that it gave me a little bit more of a sense that I was okay, whoever I was, and that I didn't need to change who I was so I would be fit in with the cool kids or with the in crowd. And I think that was part of my mom's gift to me because she was very accepting of who I was. Mm. So when you say she was like very accepting of who you were, I'm like, you know, I get the sense of that, but I wonder now you guys have, you have kids, you've written this book. So how to, how to talk. So little kids will listen and you, you've faced all these issues in your, in your own kids and your own parenting. And, and this idea coming down to this sort of nugget of accepting who we are, it's like, you know, we want to, parents want to accept who their kids are. Like they want to like leave them feeling secure and loving who they are and things like that. Yet at the same time, you know, when a little kid or a toddler or something like that is freaking out, we feel intense pressure from just from our habit, from when we grew up or society or whatever to say like, no, I do not accept this, you know, and I do, I do not accept what you are this doing. This is right bad. Now. This is really bad. You know? yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm not sure what my question is here, but it's like really, I, I guess what I'm thinking about the listener listening to this and saying, yeah, like this sounds great, accepting who your kids yeah. really are but I can't have him like whacking his sister over the head, you know? So wh- what? So what? <laughs> what do you mean accept it? You know, it sounds very nice. It sounds very nice. But, uh, you know, easier said than done when whacking is going on, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the hardest thing for all of us, for all parents, including Julie, I'm guessing, and certainly including myself, is to be accepting when our kids are having negative feelings and, you know, when they're angry or even when they're sad and disappointed, you know, we don't want them to be sad and disappointed. We don't want them to cry. We want to say it's not so bad or don't be scared or, you know, that's nothing to get upset about because we don't want to reinforce negative feelings. And the ironic truth is that if we can bring ourselves to accept the negative feelings, it's only then that the positive feelings can come rushing back in. You know, so when we see a kid starting to have a major meltdown because his friend, his little, you know, three-year-old friend got sick and can't come for the play date, you know, we want to say, you know, it's okay. You see him every day in school. You'll see him again next week when he's feeling better. You don't want to get sick, do you? And that's not going to help. That's not going to change the fact that in this moment, in his little toddler heart full of a, you know, intense roller coaster of emotion, he is feeling crushing disappointment. So what's going to really help him is, you know, to have a parent who could say, oh, you were look so looking forward to that play date. It's so disappointing. You know, you were planning to use your trucks and dig a big hole in the backyard. So to have somebody just fully accept that negative feeling and not try to explain why we shouldn't be having the negative feeling. It's a very powerful thing. And it's so difficult to do. And certainly we don't advocate sitting back and allowing violence. So if a child is whacking another child, the first order of business is to protect, you know, to leap in and physically separate. And, you know, with whatever words come to your mind, usually in my house would be like, no, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but then we have a choice. Once we get everybody safe, which direction are we going to go? Are we going to say, what is the matter with you? You're supposed to love your brother. In which case our kid will probably say, or at least think, well, I don't love him. I hate him. Why do you even have to have him? <laughs> or we can take the other path and accept the feeling and say, boy, you were really angry at your brother, something he did really annoyed you, which accepts the feeling. If it doesn't accept the action, we're not accepting that people hurt each other. You know, you know, we might say, after we finish yelling, no, we might say, I can't let you hurt him. But we accept the feeling. And then that opens the dialogue and it opens the heart. Yeah, I'm so mad at him. 
you know, he broke my Lego spaceship. Oh, he was trying to play with it and he doesn't know how to hold things delicately. And you work so hard on that. Yeah. You know, boy, we really need a safe place for those Legos. That's what's actually going to help a kid return to fond feelings for his brother. And I know that, you know, my mom always said, she would quote Dr. Gannat and say, for you learning these skills, it will always be, you'll always speak with an accent, but for your children, it will be their native tongue. And I am the child, so I should be speaking with a native tongue. And I feel like a lot of times I do, a lot of times these skills come so naturally to me, but sometimes they don't. Just like any parent, I wanna protect my kid from sadness or disappointment. And it's hard for me to react helpfully when kids are very angry or hurting each other. And that's when I fall back on my intellectual knowledge <laughs> or, or I just do it the wrong way. And then I come back and say, boy, next time I'm gonna do this better. So it's, it's great for it to be part of you, but it's also, it's also great to know it intellectually and be able to you know, sometimes just go back to the formula because sometimes our emotions, you know, we're, we're only human. Our emotions get the better of us. We all get frustrated. We all get angry. Yeah. And with our kids, we, we have so much of our, like, I think we have so much of our, our ego, honestly, really tied up into it. Like they're a reflection of us. We are seen as having so much influence or we're, you know, society quote unquote sees that we are almost re responsible for their actions, which of course is crazy because they're a whole other human being, right? But, you know, we, we have so much of this, our own self identity, almost like wrapped up into who they are and how they act. So those- Sure. And, and we don't know, we don't understand how little control we have over their actions until we're actually parents ourselves. Because I certainly remember being judgmental of other parents. You know, oh, why is that child hitting another child? His parents must spank him at home or his parents must fight in front of him. And, and then I had my own little kids who, you know, merrily hit and kicked and bit when they were <laughs> two-year-olds. And I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I think it's hard also because when we first have kids, they are completely dependent on us. And we, we have to meet their every need. And anything they do, we have pretty much control over where they go because we put them there and then they grow into these little toddlers or these little, little ones who start to have opinions about what they want to do or whether they want to do it and I think sometimes they grow faster than our conception of who they are and what our relationship is to them and so we think well I still should be controlling them and, and deciding what they do and, and where they go and they have a different opinion and we have to adjust to that. I, and I think sometimes that happens, they, they're ahead of us in, in that process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've kind of dived into sort of the content of this, but you were, Joanna, you were, you were like raising your kids, right? When you, when you, I love the story you tell in the book. And I wonder if you could just tell the story of like how you were kind of at a play date or at a baby meeting and someone was like, oh, by the way, there's this amazing book. And is that when you kind of revisited the content of how to talk? So <laughs> listen, I'm just curious about like, when did you say, decide, oh, let me go and look back at this intellectually and reshore this up in myself? I think having my first son was like learning to ride on a bucking Bronco because he is a very, you know, strong minded individual. I remember when the other parents were dressing their little little toddlers in cute colorful outfits you know mine insisted on putting his own clothes on and he was like a little beatnik he would only wear black with his black shirt and black pants and when everyone was carefully feeding their babies mine insisted on feeding himself and always made a big mess everybody else was neat uh, you know so he was he had a very strong will you know, I was always thinking about, you know, skills and, you know, how can I handle this without butting heads? But I, I didn't tell anyone that my mother had written this book because I felt like I was working as hard as I could, just, you know, running after this kid and, and trying to get him to cooperate, you know, so I didn't feel like I was the model of the perfect parent. And, you know, I don't want people looking at me and thinking like, hmm, 
Like, so her mother wrote a parenting book? Really? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I kept it on the down low. And, and, and then there was that play group where one of the other moms said, oh, Joanna, you have to read this book. It's just your style. You would love it. I guess she had heard me talking and it sounded familiar. You know, it sounded like the skills in this book. And then I couldn't you know, deny my parentage at that point. I said, you know, yeah, my mom wrote that book. And, <laughs> and that's when I was outed. You know, she, she called out to everyone, you know, hey guys, Joanna's mom wrote this book and she never told us. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's when, it's not that it rekindled me, you know, looking back at the skills for my own life, but that's when I got involved in giving talks and then giving parenting workshops because then people started saying like, oh, you could come talk at our church. Oh, you could come talk at our mother's group. You could come talk at our school. And, and at first I thought, well, what do, well I, don't, I don't really have anything to say to you. I'm just trying to keep my head above water. But then I realized that I, I actually use all these skills every day in trying to keep my head above water. So I thought, well, I'll share that. You know, and that, there's a lot of crazy stories there. So yeah. that's how I got started walking in my in my mom's big boots. Is she still with us, your mom? She is. Oh, she's she's living on Long Island. All right. Yes. All right. <laughs> that's... I just talked to her yesterday. <laughs> All right. Well, hello to mom if you're uh-huh. listening. So great to great to have you here. <laughs> Are you frustrated with parenting? Do you want to practice conscious, compassionate parenting, but you don't know how? It's not easy, and there's no roadmap for this. Until now. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, creator of the Mindful Parenting course, and I know how frustrating it is because I've been there. I struggled as a young mom, and when I found myself yelling and triggered by my child, I knew there had to be a better way, and there is. Mindful parenting is different from other parenting trainings. They don't tell you that all of that good advice is as good as useless when our internal stress response is triggered. Mindful parenting teaches you research-based tools and practices to reduce your stress response so that you can respond rather than react. And it teaches you exactly what to say so that you can create willing cooperation from your child. You can learn more and enroll at mindfulparentingcourse.com and you can join us for a free live training coming up soon where you'll learn why your kids don't listen to you, how your brain undermines your parenting, and how to create cooperative kids without losing your temper. Sign up now at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. That's mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. I'll see you there. So let's, let's transition to talk a little bit about like, so you guys were, you know, you were, you were raised in this kind of like the way I see it, you were raised in this like alternative utopian universe where you were actually (laughs) spoken to in this like really respectful way. And, and for most of us, we were talked to in this way that was different, you know, maybe. I'll just say, and our parents were doing the best that they could, but what are some of the, you know, I see these as like things that just get handed down through generations, but what are some of the mistakes and the, the, the problems of the way most people normally talk to little kids or, or kids in general? Hmm. Do you want to take that, Julie? Julie, Well, uh, yeah, I think Joanna touched on this. I think that a lot of parents, when we see our kids, either unhappy or disappointed or frustrated or angry. We want to fix it. And so we try to tell them not to feel that way. We try to talk them out of it. You know, a kid is scared because there's a big thunderclap and and the kid starts crying. And we say, no, no, it's okay. It's nothing to be scared of. Instead of saying, ooh, that was a loud sound. That, you know, a loud loud sound can be scary. So I think that's not our first instinct. And that would be one of the ways that I think parents can actually perpetuate or promote this, the feeling instead of helping a kid through that feeling. Mm -hmm. We basically tell them not to feel this feeling because it makes us uncomfortable. And 
And, and then, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't help them not feel the feeling. Go, or we go think, figure. <laughs> I can fix. You know, a kid comes and says, "Oh, my, you know, my 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 clay cat broke. I made it at school, and now the tail broke off." And we want to say, "Oh, honey, you can make another one tomorrow. You know, it's not a big yeah. deal." Because we want to fix it. Because we don't want them to feel bad. And we're thinking. I mean, I think it looks like a cap, but I wasn't really sure to begin with. It's not really a big deal if it doesn't have a, ca- a tail because really, you know, you can't really tell anyway. You know, that's what we're thinking. And the kid's thinking, it's wrong. It's ruined, you know. But if we say, oh, honey, you can make another one tomorrow. Very rare does a child say, oh, didn't think of that. Thanks, mom. You know, and just <laughs> come right out of it. <laughs> They're probably going to insist more. No, no, I can't make another one. It's, this is one special. We're really dwelling on this feeling thing because I think it's just so challenging, even for us as adults. I I had a friend recently who was talking to me on the phone about this doctor's appointment that she dreaded. She was going to have some tests. And she said, you know, I'm worried that it's the big C. And, you know, she meant cancer. And the first thing that rose to my mind to say was, you know, oh no, don't even think that. Mm. But, you know, I, I kind of bit my tongue because I know you're supposed to accept people's feelings when they're upset intellectually. <laughs> and, and I said, something along the lines of, boy, that's a heavy worry to be carrying around. And my friend, gave this sort of explosive response. She said, yes, it is. And do you know what people tell me? I said, what? She said, they tell me not to even think about that. Isn't that absurd? How could you not even think about it? And I thought, that's what I was about to tell you because we don't want to think about these terrible things. But the relief the relief that it sort of exploded out of her when I managed to force myself to, you know, to accept that, that worry and that fear, you know, was just blew through the phone. And I thought, boy, this is hard. This is hard. Even when you practice, it's hard. It's hard to face scary and upsetting things. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's almost like, Responding with empathy, right? Like saying, like, I hear you, I see you. It takes a certain level of like innate kind of bravery, right? Like yeah. to say that this is, this is, this sucks. This is hard. And to just accept that in ourselves and to accept that for them, that's- And really, we can't yeah. always do it. It takes some, some innate level of bravery and comfort with that and also a certain kind of mood a certain kind of giving mood which as parents we're not always in that mood so you know we can't we can't ask for a hundred percent dr Chaim ganat used to say you don't have to be orthodox you can be reform <laughs> who is dr ganat because you mentioned him a few oh, times he is my mom's mentor so mm-hmm. he wrote a book he wrote the book between parent and child and between parent and teacher he gave these workshops and classes that first introduced my mom to this kind of, of thinking and this kind of approach. And, and it just felt so right to her that she, she kept going with it. And he, he, he's the foundation of this, this method. But anyway, it's not, but it can't be all about feelings. It's, you know, feeling, you know, Oh, accept the feeling, accept the feeling. We still have to get (laughs) all these things right yes yes you know so like maybe we should move on before people get annoyed with us you know, i gotta get my kid to brush the teeth i gotta get him to eat i gotta get, to get dressed so you know there's that whole component as well but I, but I, th- I think it's important that you linger on accepting the, the feelings because the thing is, is like, if we just try to push past it, it just takes up more time anyway. You know, if, if yeah. we're like, they're saying, oh, this is horrible, like my toothbrush is sticky and oh, I'm really <laughs> upset about it or whatever. And we're just like, oh, just do it. Just do it. That there's, that ends up being explosive and taking longer anyway. You know, and when we are accepting those feelings that we're creating that connection and saying, oh, I hear you, I see you, I care about how you're feeling right now, then 
it snowballs in a positive way. And I think that, so you're right to linger on that because it, it, that creating that positive snowball can just make, you know, a big, big difference. And especially when they're young. So I, I love that this is about when they're young. Sure. Because kids can't act right if they don't feel right. People can't act right if they don't feel right. Yeah. And, and it seems like it'd be more efficient to just be able to, you know, give them orders. And like I say jump, you say how high. But sometimes the longer way is the shorter way, as you, as you so eloquently <laughs> explained. And, and anyway, who has kids because they want their life to be more efficient? You know, that's... <laughs> Good luck with that. (laughs) So you talk about a bunch of things here in the book. You talk about tools for resolving conflict, tools for praise, tools for engaging cooperation. So I I love this like idea of how do how are we going to engage cooperation? And you talk about how to speak instead of using threats. So what's wrong with threats? (laughs) What's wrong with threats? Put you that down that right question. now. You'll be sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Julie. Give I was your say, If you ask me that question one more time, I'm hanging up the phone. <laughs> How does that make you feel? He says, hey, if you throw sand one more time, we're going straight home. And they say that the problem with that sentence is the kid doesn't hear the whole sentence. What the kid hears is throw sand. One more time. <laughs> you know, so sometimes a threat can be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. It but in general, really nobody hard. nobody reacts well to threats. I mean, we, we put a lot in our book about trying it out on yourself. You know, how do you feel when somebody talks to you that way? And how do you feel? You feel like you want to resist with all your might. You know, like, don't you oh, dare yeah. tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'll show you. <laughs> I'm not doing that just because you said so. <laughs> so so we're working against ourselves. Yeah. And, and again, it's a natural, it's, it's a natural thought pattern to us to present something as a threat. Well, if you don't clean up those toys in the next five minutes, you know, I'm not going to give you dessert. You know, we try to think about like, you know, how can I, how can I get some control over this kid? I know I'll, I'll, I'll threaten him. I'll let him know. But as soon as, as soon as we try it on ourselves, we realize that there's going to be such a backwash of bad feeling and resentment that we're, again, we're working against ourselves. There's a backwash of bad feelings and it often just doesn't work. So. so. There's that too. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's ineffective and it makes them, yeah, it's that resentment. It's like, if you're playing the long game, then it's it's really works against you in the long game. You got to play the long. And, and also, if you have a sibling in the house, you're going to see that kid turn around and talk yeah. to his or her sibling that or, way. Or her friend. You know, if you, if you don't let me be queen, you can't come to my birthday party. And that doesn't <laughs> sound so nice when we hear it from our kids. Yeah, that's a big wake up wake up call. I remember like exactly where I was going into the playroom and hearing my older daughter say something like that to my younger daughter and be like, Oh my God, that's what I sound like. Yeah. Oh no, this is gonna change. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's so, so tempting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we feel like, oh, I have to motivate them somehow. What am I gonna do? So yeah. Yeah. So, so what do we do instead? <laughs> Yeah. So, so what do we do? What Julie, do we, what, do, what do we do? So one of our favorite, one of my favorite tools, <laughs> especially when we're talking about little kids, is to be playful, to turn something into a game. So, you know, I had a dad in one of my, actually a couple in one of my groups, and he said that they, they live in a small house and the kids had taken out all the toys and they were all over the, the living room. And the parents were just beside themselves yelling at the kids. They were two and five trying to get them to clean up and it was not working and the and the wife said to her, her husband I'm out of here I can't take this anymore and she went in the bedroom and slammed the door and, and her husband was just you know trying to come hey you know cut it out get over here you know get, put those legos away and it was not working and his wife opened the door and she said hey that's not in the workshop you know <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the danger of taking the workshop together right <laughs> 
so so the dad you know he's thinking oh yeah we just talked about what we're supposed to do you know be playful so he there was a a little stuffed giraffe on the floor so he picked up the stuffed giraffe and he said hey i want to go back with my stuffed animal friends won't you put me away and the two-year-old like ran up to him five-year-old just was watching the two-year-old ran up and grabbed the giraffe and threw it into the cabinet and so then the five-year-old looks like he wants to get in the action. So the dad picked up a truck and said, you know, I want to go back with my truck friends. And so the five-year-old ran up and they, they, you know, he started just talking for all the objects that were on the floor. We call it make inanimate objects speak. That's the tool that we call it. And suddenly it wasn't a chore to clean up. It was a game. And the two-year-old and the five-year-old got the whole thing cleaned up. And the wife, she sticks her head out the door and she says, that was from the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's one of that's one way to to engage our kids cooperation is to make it something that they want to do to be playful and kids are all about play that's that's how they learn that's that's how they live so if we can turn something into a game you know where we suddenly can change the mood and get some cooperation instead of instead of all yelling yeah yeah and you might say where's the work ethic you know <laughs> or shouldn't they just do it because we tell them to it's like well Two-year-olds and five-year-olds don't have much of a work ethic. They don't see much point. You know, they don't thrill to the sight of a tidy house. I mean, it's really our need for it to be tidy. So, so if we can make it a game, whether it's through making inanimate objects talk or putting on music and cleaning up quickly to fast music and then slowly when the music gets slow and then freeze when the music stops. A teacher told me that game. She, she has oh, kids like clean that. up with that every day. And she said, everybody wants to clean up. You know, if we can make it fun for them, then they're learning that, you know, yes, we clean up every day and and it's fun and we all cooperate and there's a good mood and there it's not part of it's not all wrapped up in threats and punishment. And and they're still learning to work and they're they're learning to work together in a nice way. And and at one point they'll grow up old enough to have a work ethic or care about tidiness or understand other people's feelings and maybe we're just going to clean this up to be you know nice for our parents but when they're little you're you're just you're just creating a strong relationship and a feeling of connectedness every time you use play to engage the cooperation rather than threats and commands and, yeah. and i think it's also a great life skill i mean if we're facing some chore ourselves we've got a huge kitchen full of dirty pots and pans and dishes and we have to clean up you know we could say to ourselves oh i just have to do it this is no fun or we could say you know i'm going to put on some music or a podcast and i'll listen to hunter while i'm, <laughs> while I'm cleaning up I, right? I bet you somebody is listening to this right now while they're cleaning up <laughs> and we this is going out to you dear listener who's, <laughs> who's scrubbing the pot <laughs> yes yes yeah. <laughs> and oh, you also but there's more i oh, just to throw a few more out there mm -hmm. there's one of the best motivators for my kids in in terms of making something fun and making something a game was playing beat the clock so mm -hmm. we you know say like you know how much did we think we can get away get you know put away in two minutes and we'd set the timer ready set go and they just love that I mean, partly probably because it looked like it had a beginning and an end, you know, that it wasn't going to be an endless cleanup and partly because everybody just like racing around madly and they love setting clocks. So there's another way to make it into a game. What I think we have dozens in our books. Dozens of them. Yes. I remember, yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're on the subject of cleaning up, I remember I was home one day with my daughter and she had taken out all the books that we had all the kids books and she had made a big circle. I think she was recreating what they do at school and circle time where they put books around in a circle or something. And I was exhausted as usual, you know, so I, all I wanted to do was sit on the couch and have her clean up, which good luck with that with, right. With a three year old. <laughs> um, but her older brothers used to love to play Monopoly and she was always the banker. And so she really liked the money from Monopoly. So I took out some Monopoly money and I told her that I would pay her. 20 monopoly dollars if she would take that book with the strawberry on it and put it back in the cabinet and she was like okay and she put it away and she said, oh and that book over there i'll pay another 20 dollars and she said 50 <laughs> i'm like 50 that's a lot of money for one book she, how about tw you know how about 30 50 she was a hard worker <laughs> 
so, you know, I had this huge stack of Monopoly money. It really wasn't any, any, <laughs> it was easy for me to pay her. So I'm like, okay. And I put it on the, you know, the other pile and she cleaned up the whole thing and I got to sit on the couch. I always thought okay. that was kind of a lucky You're thing. just uh, lounging, doling out your money. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it wasn't always that easy, I have to say, but that, that was a great game for me and for her. <laughs> That's a great one. But you talk also about, and I'm, I welcome as many playful things as you as you want to bring, but you talk also about giving information. And it was in, it's interesting because I have a lot of moms who take mindful parenting and we, we talk about ways to communicate to get your own needs met, right? And they often have part partners who are resistant to like, they, they say that this, the child should just do this thing because I say so. And I shouldn't have to explain myself. Like I've, I've heard that a number of times, like I shouldn't have to explain it, but you talk about giving information. And I think that we're, you know, I think also societally, we're kind of collectively learning that we kind of need human beings want to have a why. Like, in fact, we saw at the art museum recently, a little sign that had like a, like a no touching sign, but it said, you know, fingers hurt, you know, they damage the painting. Oh, touch. And I was like, Oh, you know, they're, they're giving information. They're telling you why you should do that rather than just don't do it. So talk to me a little bit about giving information Oh, and also even like, you know, you also talked about describing how you feel as a parent to, to young kids. How do, how do we do that to really young kids for really young kids? Julie, who's answering that one? You or me? <laughs> the trials and tribulations of yeah. people. Here we go. Um, well, giving information is, first of all, useful because you're giving a kid information. And second of all, it's useful because you're eliminating the command, which creates resistance because nobody likes being ordered around. So, you know, you, you're winning both ways. So what's an example of giving information, you know, the, Oh, the milk gets sour when it, when it's left in the sun. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? The kid sees that they left the milk in the sunny spot on the table and they say, Oh, the milk's in the sun. It's going to get sour. Oh, I'll put it away in the refrigerator. The kid tells herself what to do. Instead of you telling the kid, hey, go pick that milk up and put it away. So she's learning about milk and she's giving herself the command. And when you think about it, that's really how we talk to our adult friends. We give them information and we trust them to tell themselves what to do. Uh, for instance, I have this I have this kitchen table that's made of pine, which was kind of a mistake because pine is very soft wood and people like to I found tap on tables with forks and knives and I cringe as I see the beautifully sanded surface get dented and so you know what do I say to an adult friend who's gouging my table you know what is the matter with you stop that immediately you're ruining my table you know no I don't say that I said oh that table's made of pine it, it dents really easily it's really soft wood it dents easy and they say oh and they stop I love that you gave that example because for me that that's like a, a test, right? If I'm being kind of like, if I'm having some respectful communication, I don't know how to do it. I imagine like, well, what if my child were like some 22 year old roommate that <laughs> I have li that lives in my house? How would I say this to that person just to get my own stuff out of the way of it? You know, but that, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I, I think I'm that's, bad. that's, you know, it's a great test. I've had, more than one parent in a workshop say, oh, oh, I get it. I just have to imagine how I would speak to an adult friend. You know, so, you know, so if your partner left a lot of dishes in the sink overnight, you know, you might say, what's the matter with you? You're such a slob. I don't want to have to look at your mess in the morning, you know, clean it up. But, oh, you know, that would probably <laughs> ruin the relationship. So you might give information. You might tell them how you feel. You might say, oh, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm so sleepy and I just want to make myself breakfast. It's, I get frustrated, I you know, encountering a pile of dirty dishes in the sink, you know, at night it's okay. But in the morning I can't, you know, and in the morning I, I'm just not awake enough to deal with it. Um, so you talk about your feelings and then the person, the other person might say, you know, oh gosh, let me be careful not to leave dirty dishes in the sink in the morning because that really upsets Joanna instead of feeling attacked. And when yeah. people are feeling attacked, they don't feel helpful. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you, these skills you've used, I imagine, have translated as your kids have grown up. I'm sure that, I mean, because the skills you talk about, giving information, telling people how you feel, empathizing, being playful, like they work wonderfully with little kids, but they work well with all ages, I imagine. That's the big secret that people come, people take the workshop <laughs> they come and they say, oh, you know, I didn't have time to try it with my kids, but it worked really well with my spouse. Yes. <laughs> That's our, that's our big secret. Yeah. And and we also are very aware that our kids quickly get bigger than us and stronger than us. And, you know, you can't just keep, you know, you can muscle a little kid around. Sometimes you can intimidate a little kid and you can just pick them up and, you know, grab them or put them where you want them to be or take them out of the room. But, you know, they very quickly grow bigger. And, and if you have a relationship that's based on, you know, respecting and caring about each other's feelings and solving problems, it's so nice when they're looking down at you, you know, when they're 12 years old and they're almost six feet tall and they're in their size 13 boots and they're looking down at you with their newly deep voices and you can just talk to them. <laughs> And they also talk to you that way instead of saying, hey, cut it out. Leave my lap, you know, stop being so rough with my laptop. They're like, hey, mom, just makes, takes a light little touch on that touch pad. You don't have to bang on it. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. So these skills, as you practice them when they're younger, these skills, communication skills, creating that, really, keeping that closeness of the relationship rather than kind of feeding that cycle of resentment. My my biggest hope, because as I told you guys, I have an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old, my biggest hope is that it will soften some of the the drama of the, you know, adolescent years. Because I know for me, my father, you know, started saying, you will do this because I am your father kind of stuff. When I And we had a lot of turmoil. It was really upsetting time, you know, when I was around 14. So how were those ages for you and your kids? Well, <laughs> that was when I felt very, I, I think I felt pretty cocky at that age because a, a lot of my friends were talking about teenagers and hormones and how difficult kids were and how they wouldn't do what you told them anymore. And I felt like, hmm, well, <laughs> I've been telling my kids what to do for years. So <laughs> there's really no change here. You know, when they're kids, they're really out of your control. I mean, most of their behavior is going on at school or with their friends, and, and you really can't, you really can't control a teenager. But if if you have a close relationship, that's your tie, that's your power to affect them is is your relationship and the fact that you care about them and respect them and they feel cared about and respected, so they will listen to you in turn. And, and I remember one of my friends, who is a lovely person, having a battle with her teenager over the car, and she had told him that he couldn't have the keys because it was snowing out, and he said, it's, you know, I'm going, you can't stop me, and they actually got into a physical scuffle where she got pushed down. It was sort of like a horrifying incident and a really nice mom and a really nice kid, but they were just in a battle. And I remember shortly after that, having my own confrontation with my son who had just gotten his license and was planning to drive to New Haven in Connecticut on Interstate 84 for some band event and I thought, you know, no, you've just driven around on these little side roads and you're all of a sudden going to be going on the interstate. You're like, you're going to die. This is terrible. And he felt very strongly that he had a license. So, you know, he should be able to do that. And I just sat down with him and, and we talked about it. And I said, boy, you know, you have a very nervous mother was able to accept his feelings from your point of view you know, you have a license, you studied, you practiced, you passed the driving test, you feel confident to do this. And, and here I am holding you back from this experience. And from my point of view, I know that driving on the interstate and getting on and off exits and merging with trucks is something that takes a lot of practice and experience. And the problem is that 
if you make a mistake, you can be terribly injured or die. And, and it just, you know, I, I, you just have a very worried mother. And, you know, we talked and talked and we came up with a solution, which was that he would, which was that his father would give him lessons getting on and off the highway because his mother was too nervous for that. <laughs> and, and then he would drive the first way, the part way and meet up with his teacher who would drive him the rest of the way into the city. And that way, you know, because he said, well, how am I going to get experience if you're so worried you won't let me have experience? But, uh, you know, we, we were able to, to talk through it and come up with a solution that felt right to both of us and was just one of those situations where there were two people who both felt very strongly and there was a lot of emotion, but, but there was also respect and ability to listen to each other. And, and that's, that's the kind of thing that happens with teenagers. Everything seems to have high stakes. So we really, you know, I really treasure that connection. You retained your influence when you needed it most. So rather than using power and then really running out of power, you still had this influence from the, the respectful way you communicated and the way you kept your relationship strong over the years. That's such a beautiful story. I love that. You were able to, you know, meet his needs and meet your needs. Yeah, my need, my need is, you know, to keep him surrounded by pillows in a room, but you know, <laughs> his need is to go out and take every risk he can take. And that's, that's really tough. Boy, that's hard for a parent to let go. Just wait, just wait until your kids get their driver's license. There's <laughs> oh. nothing like that. But, uh, but, you know, I couldn't, I can't keep the keys away from a kid who's six foot two and 180 pounds and, you know, full of muscle. You know, I, I can talk to him though. <laughs> Yeah. Julie and Joanna, you guys have so many gems in your book, taking how to talk so the kids can listen and, and translating it for little kids. I could probably keep you here for two hours asking you questions. I'm sure my listener would love that. I feel a little bad that I didn't even get to talk about sibling rivalry or anything oh. yet. Do you, do you have a few minutes to next talk? time? Yeah. <laughs> whole nother topic. <laughs> yes. Yes. Maybe we could do it. Maybe we could do it again. That would be lovely. But I, I feel really heartened by your, your work and your stories of what, what you've shared and the way it's, it's turned out for you in your own lives. It's really hope, hopeful. It's a message of hope that you have, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's a message of hope. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's our, that's our other secret dream that that you know, we end all wars and 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 heal humanity. I mean, I think that's that's where people first learn how to deal with conflict is at home. When you want the window open and your brother wants it closed, or or you want to use the blue marker and he does too, or every little conflict that happens at home, we're teaching our kids what do you do when when you're in conflict with somebody else, and we're trying to provide parents with tools that they can use with their kids and their kids can use when they grow up to be adults and conflicts in the world. It's a model for them. It's a model for them. What do you do? What do you do when, when your needs are in conflict? Do you, do you think about a way to punish the other person or a way to force the other person or do you or listen to the person. other or hurt the other person or do you listen to each other and see if you can come up with something that respects the needs of both people? It's, it's a, it's a model for, for life. Yeah, yeah. And for those of us who were raised in the, the, the stronger party always wins model, this is another amazing resource to help us into that model of, you know, I respect your needs, you respect mine kind of thing, where we want to model how to, how to do that. So I, I just want to thank you for the, the work that you've done with this book. I know it sort of came, I was like, oh, there's one for little kids. I didn't know. I was so excited. <laughs> and so I think everybody should should absolutely go out and get how to talk so little kids will listen because you have a lot of wonderful things in there and then you have those great drawings in there too so there you go <laughs> you'll laugh you'll cry you'll chuckle <laughs> <laughs> there are all the drugs in there yeah so thank you thank you for for doing this work thank you for being on the mindful mama podcast where can people find out more about you julie and joanna and in the book and what you're doing Julie, tell them. Well, we have a website for our book, howtotalksolittlekidswillisten.com. 
And we also have a Facebook page. If you search for how to talk so little kids will listen, you'll find us. And I also have a website with my workshops and, and support groups and, that, and, and consultations and that sort of thing. And that's julieking.org. So you can find us in any of those places. And if you get the book, we also have an email address at the back. If you go to the chapter called The End, question mark, <laughs> we have our email address there. So you can write to us and we try to write back to everybody. It's kind of And we feel terrible guilt because we don't write back to everybody, but we write back to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> we try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And we'll link up to those, those sites in mindfulmamapodcast.com on the show notes too. So, so thank you guys. Thank you guys for the, your time. Thank you for the work. Thank you for coordinating the two of you together. It's been uh, my pl big pleasure to talk to you and to, to really have this time to, to, to share your wisdom with everybody. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for, thank for you. inviting us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so glad you were here. Uh, don't you love Julie and Joanna? They are so relatable. And yo, it's not easy, right? It's hard to change how you speak with your kids. And that's why we have the Mindful Parenting free training coming up. I hope you'll join us. You can go to mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. And we will be teaching you a whole bunch of things, really getting to the root of what are your intentions as a parent and really doing some deeper dive work that is essential. And then the Mindful Parenting course itself will be enrolling soon. So you can go to mindfulparentingcourse.com, join the free training, and then we'll let you know about when enrollment opens for the Mindful Parenting course. It only opens a couple times a year. It's a live course. We offer a year of support. It's all sorts of coaching. It's a, it's a big transformation. So I hope that you will check that out and join us over at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. And I guess I will see you there. And next week, we have another exciting guest. I'm super excited to talk about how to stop yelling with and Anna Seawald again. I'm so excited to have her back. So that next week is gonna is a really great conversation. So I can't wait to see you then. And in the meantime, feel free to get in touch with me. Reach out at the mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. And you know, when you do that, we're gonna direct you to a pop-up Facebook group we have just for this free training where we can connect there. So I would love to meet you and say hello. That'll be cool, right? Let's do that. Anyway, wishing you a beautiful week. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate and value this time with you and this time to connect deeply and to connect about important stuff. So I want to honor you for listening and thank you. And I'm wishing you a beautiful week, my friend. Namaste. Are you frustrated with parenting? Do you want to practice conscious, compassionate parenting, but you don't know how? It's not easy, and there's no roadmap for this. Until now. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I know how frustrating it is because I've been there. I struggled as a young mom, and when I found myself yelling and triggered by my child, I knew there had to be a better way, and there is. Mindful parenting is different from other parenting trainings. They don't tell you that all of that good advice is as good as useless when our internal stress response is triggered. Mindful parenting teaches you research-based tools and practices to reduce your stress response so that you can respond rather than react. And it teaches you exactly what to say so that you can create willing cooperation from your child. You can learn more and enroll at mindfulparentingcourse.com and you can join us for a free live training coming up soon where you'll learn why your kids don't listen to you, how your brain undermines your parenting, and how to create cooperative kids without losing your temper. Sign up now at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. That's mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. I'll see you there.